This is the third video on Royce's conception or ethics of loyalty. In the first video, I gave Royce's definition of loyalty. In the second video, what I articulated was Royce's argument for why loyalty is the ultimate good for human beings. That is, why loyalty has prudential value. The reason was because it solves the problem of our existence, this central problem that Royce thinks that we all face. This is what should we do with our lives. The idea here is that once we find a social cause to which we can be loyal to, then our struggle to determine what we should do with our lives ends. So loyalty is taken to be an individual good because it solves this particular problem. I'll put a link in the description to both of these videos. So what we have then is a positive argument in favor of the goodness of loyalty. But just because we have a positive argument in favor of loyalty does not mean that there are no positive arguments in favor of other theories of what might be the ultimate good for us as human beings. So in this video, I want to consider some of the alternatives to Royce's idea that loyalty is the ultimate individual good. And I want to consider Royce's objections to these rival theories. So along with the positive argument in favor of loyalty as the ultimate individual good, and Royce's arguments against any alternative theories, this might be said to tip the balance in favor of why we should see loyalty as the ultimate individual good. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is like, what are these rival theories that Royce considers and then ultimately rejects? So the place to start is with an assumption that Royce makes. This assumption is that if we're gonna talk about the ultimate individual good, then that good has to in some way be aligned with the desires or ultimate goals of an individual. So it has to mesh with what we desire or what we truly want or what we would willingly accept as being good for us, our ultimate needs or desires. So some examples would be the ultimate good cannot be involve complete self-sacrifice. It can't be the giving your life to, let's say, God, country, humanity, if this is not something that you desire. It's not something that you ultimately want to do. In addition, it can't be to something like, let's say, happiness or pleasure if the happiness or pleasure is not one of the particular types that you would desire. So if someone says, I'm just going to give you pleasure and it makes your life better, Royce is going to reject this if this is not the type of pleasure that you would desire or want. So this conception has some implications for the type of ethical theory that Royce will ultimately develop. Royce has pretty forceful words that any ethical theory that disregards the right or duty of an individual to centralize their lives around their own purposes or desires or wants is a bad ethical theory. So constructing an ethical theory that says like you should do X, Y, or Z, but those completely disregard what would make your own life good is one that Royce doesn't really consider. So in general, there's a problem. While we should model our theory of prudential value and our ethical theory around what is good for the individual, the difficulty becomes, well, what is good for us? What do we ultimately desire? Royce is pretty forceful about this. He writes, be an individual, seek your own individual good, seek that good thoroughly, unswervingly, unsparingly with all your heart and soul. But I persist in asking, where in heaven above and in earth beneath have you to look for this highest good? Where can you find it? This brings me to my second point. Even if we assume that the ultimate good is something that we desire or is in our self-interest, this does not mean that Royce is right, that the ultimate individual good is loyalty. Perhaps the ultimate individual good, perhaps what has prudential value is something else. It could be individual pleasure. So this is a hedonistic view. It could be finding your best fit in a social order, increase of social control or power. It could be maybe self-control, autonomy, or it could be some kind of spiritual inner peace that you acquire. These are all ideas that Royce considers and then will reject. We don't have time to go through all of them, so what I'm going to do is focus on the three. So the first theory that Royce considers is the idea that what we ultimately desire, what's in our what's the ultimate individual good, is our own happiness. This is what we truly desire in life. We'll call this, just for convenience, the hedonistic view on things. The idea here is that our, what our base, ultimate desire, what's going to make us better off, what we truly need, is an increase of pleasure and a decrease of pain. So Royce is considering this idea of hedonism not as pleasure is good for you regardless of whether or not you desire it. Instead, he's 
taking all of our desires to be understood or simplified or reducible to a desire for increased pleasure and a desire for decreased pain. So he's thinking whenever we want something or desire something, he's saying what we truly want, what the real object of our desire is, is just an increase of pleasure and a decrease of pain. So he's not taking pleasure and pain as good for you regardless of whether you want it or not, but he's taking what our ultimate desire to be is this increase of pleasure and decrease of pain. So a couple of illustrations of this. The first would be like, let's say I want an A in my philosophy course. This is something I desire. For Royce would translate this in the hedonistic terms is what I really want, what is really I'm after in terms of what's good for me is the increase of pleasure that corresponds with getting an A in the philosophy course. So the increase of pleasure is primary. Same with, let's say, eating food if we're hungry. What we're really after is the pleasure associated with eating that food. Or if we're going to read a book or listen to a symphony or something along those lines, more refined pleasures, what we're really after here is the pleasure associated with reading the book or listening to the symphony. So Royce has three remarks or kind of critical stances towards hedonism. The first is that even if the satisfaction of all our desires comes with an increase of pleasure and an decrease of pain, that is, whenever we satisfy a desire, our pleasure goes up, or whenever our desires are frustrated, our, we, we've experienced pain. Even if that's the case, we still can't reduce all of our desires to an increase of pleasure and a decrease of pain. The idea is that the object of our desire is not the pleasure and pain itself, not the event of experiencing the pleasure and pain, but instead, pleasure and pain simply just accompany the satisfaction of having our desires met. Or pain is simply always there when, whenever we're frustrated. So the idea here is that the goal of our desire is not the pleasure and pain, even if we always experience pleasure and pain with the satisfaction and the frustration of our desires. Here are some quick examples. So let's say you desire to have your thirst quenched because you're thirsty. For Royce, what you're desiring is the quenching of the thirst, um, not the pleasure associated with having your thirst quenched. Nevertheless, whenever you do have your thirst quenched, whenever you realize that your desires, it comes with this accompanying pleasure associated with satisfying your desire. Same thing with hunger. If you are hungry, what you desire is having your hunger satisfied, not the pleasures of the dinner table. Finally, look at friendship. In the case of friendship, what you desire is the value associated with having a good friend. Not necessarily the pleasures associated with it, but you just take that friendship to be have be valuable independent of the pleasures associated with it. Even though having a good friend does bring you a lot of joy, happiness, pleasure. But that's not what you are searching for in having that good friend. The second point Royce makes is that he just denies the idea that many of our desires search out pleasure and pain. He says that a lot of time, many of our desires, we just don't know why we desire those things or the, res the, re the result of instinct, prior training, maybe the result of evolution. So the idea here would be that some desires are just there to keep us alive. So we might desire to eat, and it's not that we are programmed to eat because we just enjoy the pleasures of eating, that's what we want, but we have this desire to eat simply because we've been built that way because it's a good trait to have in order to keep a particular type of organism alive like ourselves. Some desires might be historical vestiges of our evolution. So Royce points out the example that children might love to climb trees because their ancient ancestors climbed trees. A third point that Royce makes is that we don't really desire to be happy at all. Pleasure is not what we really seek because the idea of trying to be happy is just an empty plan. It, it has, it's contentless. Here's Royce's argument. I don't know if I quite fully understand it, but it goes something like this. So happiness involves, to some degree, the satisfaction of our desires. So if all of our desires were frustrated, we wouldn't be happy. So the idea is that if we have this state of being happy, then we meet some of our desires. But our present desires, the ones that we have as human beings, are just countless. There's so many of them, and a lot of them are conflicting. They work against each other. So what we really want 
is some kind of plan that unifies our desires, some sort of cause that allows us to harmonize, direct our desires, to remedy this like, central conflict of having a lot of desires and those desires conflicting with each other. But happiness, the plan of being happy, is not such a plan. If someone says, well, I'm not sure what to do with my life, I have so many things I want to do, and another person says, well, you should just be happy, uh, that doesn't tell you exactly what to do at all. You don't have a plan for your life just to try to be happy. So Roy says that what we really want, what our underlying desire is, is some way to harmonize all this conflict that we have inside of ourselves. And being happy is not a plan at all. And so it can't be our overarching desire. In contrast to all this, when you are loyal, you actually do have a plan because what you have is some social cause that you take to be valuable and that you can harmonize all of your actions towards trying to instantiate it. So once you find some concrete social cause that you can actually freely accept and practically serve and you do so thoroughly, then you have a way of taking all of those conflicting desires and bringing them into unity that's directed at realizing this cause that you have found. So that's it for hedonism. He thinks that hedonism is a kind of dead end. It's not our ultimate desire to try to be happy or to gain pleasure. So another thought is that, well, maybe happiness is not even a reasonable or practical goal. We all have to live in the social order anyway, and we can't pursue it, pursue what's going to make us maximally happy. Instead, the only reasonable, practical goal that we can kind of take on is to find some tolerable relationship to the society that we live in. We try to look for, let's say, our best fit in society. And so this would be the theory that we should try to live in a way that society wants, that we can fit into. And so the ultimate individual good for us is to find this best fit. What we're trying to do is slot in where we're needed and at the same time that we can actually tolerate. So if the society doesn't want artists, then um, we shouldn't try to pursue a life of an artist because that's not what's desired by society. If society wants, let's say, plumbers or computer programmers, then we should learn to code or learn to uh, be a plumber so far as that we can tolerate this particular life. Royce rejects this idea because the social order for many of us doesn't give us a way to express our individuality. So you may live your life by fulfilling one of the jobs society has for you or wants, but it's not going to be a good life for you and your life is not going to be an expression of the ultimate good for you. You, what you'll find yourself doing is if the society is not set up such that you can find a cause that you can be loyal to, that if you're just looking for some kind of compromise between what you want and what society wants, is that you're going to revolt against it. What you're doing here is pursuing society's good as a cog in the machine and not your own personal good. So this ignores your individual good, your individual needs, and any theory of prudential value, any ethical theory that requires you to give up your ultimate individual desires, Royce, remember, just immediately rejects. So there's an interesting quote. It's just kind of a fun quote that Royce makes concerning this that I, I want to read to you because it's great. He says that if this chance social existence furnishes to you your only plan of life, you therefore live in a sad but altogether too common wavering between blind submission and incoherent rebellion. So the idea here is that if society is set up in a way that you search for this best fit, but the best fit for you is one that doesn't meet your individual desires, then you are either resigned to a horrible existence that you don't care for, or you just revolt against it left and right. And you kind of waver between this sort of sad existence and this personal individual expression of your rage towards this fit that you find yourself in. And as Royce notes, this is unfortunately a pretty commonplace phenomena. A lot of people find themselves in societies where they just don't fit. And so they're stuck between not being able to satisfy their individual desires for what would make their lives good and living in a society which they're sort of forced to do. 
The last theory that Royce considers is the idea that the ultimate individual good is the acquisition of power. This is what we really want. We just want to gain more power. By power, Royce doesn't mean physical strength. Uh, what instead he means is social control. The ability to shape social conditions to meet our particular interests. So examples are pretty easy to think of. You think of politicians, tyrants, wealthy individuals who manipulate the social order to allow them to gain more wealth, religious leaders, perhaps, I don't know, drug lords, maybe social media influencers, athletes who have a large amount of social influence as well. These would be examples of individuals that have power. And so what Royce says is that we ultimately desire is the acquisition of more and more power here. Royce has three objections to this particular theory, and I just want to look at two of these objections. Uh, the first one is that the search or lust or goal of power is never ending. It's just an insatiable desire that we can never ultimately realize. So the idea here is that if what you're after is power, then there's no conceivable limit to the power that you can acquire. You always want more and more and more. So an example would be, let's say you're the mayor of a city. Well, you have power or some measure of power over your constituents. Well, then you search out, since your ultimate individual good is more power, you try to be the governor, maybe the president, and maybe the sort of overlord of the earth. And if that doesn't work, you try to search out even further. For Royce, this is a kind of depressing individual good because at every stage in which we gain more power, we're constantly reminded of what we lack, what we want, what we need. We condemn ourselves to the state of constant disappointment. And so the idea here is that power can't be the ultimate individual good. Let's say you're the mayor of a town. Well, here you've gained some power. You have some social control over the laws or regulations that are found in your town or city or municipality. Now, when you have this power, you are again reminded of what you lack. You lack the power to influence individuals outside of your city or town. And so you search out more. And so in searching out more, you become, let's say, you're successful and you become the governor of the state. So now you're in charge of many cities or many towns. But again, you're reminded of all the power that you don't have. And so Royce points out the idea that here you're constantly disappointed. It never can be the case that you can realize your goal because you're always reminded of and pointed to the fact that you lack what you really want, which is total power. The second objection that Royce raises is that the search for power is actually self-destructive. The idea here is that as you gain more social control to serve your purposes, you also increase the number of points of conflict between yourself and one, those whose purposes are in contrast with yours, and two, those whose purposes might even be aligned with yours, but also search themselves for more power or control. So the idea is, let's say you're, again, the mayor of a town. In this case, you might have 50,000 points of conflict, when if you were just a private citizen, you didn't have all these points of conflict. You have, let's say, the 20,000 people who did not vote for you and would like to see you out of office. But you also have the 30,000 people who want your position. So the idea is that if everyone's goal, everyone's individual need, the thing that they search for to make their individual lives better is the acquisition of power, then you have more people who are trying to get what you have. And so as you increase your scope of power, you become, let's say, the governor, you increase your points of conflict with those who have, with those who want what you have. You could see maybe an example of this with respect to, let's say, social media influencers or individuals that are in the social limelight. The media tends to pay more attention to them, and there tends to be a higher degree of scrutiny on those that have a lot of control. If you're the president, then you're going, your every move is going to be scrutinized, and there's always going to be an individual that seeks to remove you. Whereas if you're little old me, then... <laughs> There's not a lot of points of conflict, and so individuals are not going to sort of search me out to, I don't know, remove me from the little power that I might have.
So the point here is that the reason we can't make the search for power the ultimate individual good is because it's just a self-destructive goal. You're searching or trying to destroy yourself. And the idea of the ultimate thing for you is to destroy yourself is not a kind of consistent goal that an individual can have. In this video, we looked at alternatives to the idea of loyalty being the ultimate individual good or having prudential value. What we've looked at is the idea that maybe pleasure or increased power or have, finding the right social fit is what we ultimately desire in our lives. But Royce has given arguments against those alternatives. So given that Royce has given a positive argument in favor of loyalty and given arguments against the alternatives, this leaves us, if you buy the steps that we followed thus far, into accepting Royce's conclusion that loyalty is what we ultimately want in life. What we look for is some social cause that we can willingly, practically, and thoroughgoingly serve. And if we can find this, then we have realized our ultimate good. This is the best thing for us. What's important to note, however, is what we haven't done is establish an ethics around loyalty. All we, Royce has established thus far, if you follow his arguments, is that loyalty is good for you as an individual. He hasn't told you what causes are morally good or morally evil. This is something we'll look at in upcoming videos. So stay tuned.